<laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Welcome to this Wednesday night talk and thank you for inviting me for being here. Um, and yeah, that was my plan is I was gonna talk for 30 minutes, do a quick presentation and then open it up for discussion. Um, I'll be talking about my area of specialty, which may um, apply also to the folks that you are you know, um, here, the reason you're in this group for um, that some of the information may apply and some of it may not, but we can talk about it. Um, I'm a social worker, an addiction counselor, and my area specialty is working with folks that um, have PTSD or trauma, but also many of the people I've worked with um, also have histories of unresolved pain. So they might not meet the criteria for PTSD, but they um, also have had a great deal of pain and that has made them vulnerable um, to abusing different things or getting um, addicted to certain things. So, um, so I'm going to screen share a PowerPoint, talk for half an hour with that, and then we'll open it up to discussion. So let me pull that up. Um, first, I got to find it. Here it is. All right. So um, the film is called Uprooting Addiction. And um, my work is really grounded in um, clinical um, training, but also some personal experience. So the reason I got involved with the documentary process or made a documentary to begin with um, was in response to the loss of my brother who um, struggled with addiction on and off um, throughout his life, but also struggled with um, unaddressed mental health issues. Um, so the film, what I didn't realize it when I was making it was really my way of keeping myself busy and dealing with my grief. Um, and in the process kind of made a whole family of other people who struggled with addiction and trauma. And I have my own history of struggling with addiction and been in recovery for 30 years. So, um, so it's like a personal and professional mix is how I ended up in this field. I think if I didn't have so much addiction in my life, I probably would have been a cook, you know, but um, because <laughs> I've been studying this personally and professionally for so long, it just kind of became a career. And I, I actually tried to avoid it, um, but, there seemed to be no avoiding it. No matter what I did, I ended up doing this. So then I finally gave it up and started to do it. Um, I just want to thank you um, for all the ways you show up. So um, you don't get a lot of thank yous in this world. Um, before I was an addiction counselor, before I was a social worker, I was a bartender, which is very strange a way to begin a career, um, one would think. But I was listening to people who were drinking then. I'm still listening to people who drink now. Um, a little nicer environment but when i had a good session i'm um, you know a good that's night our bartender oh i'm gonna ask to, to mute and actually i'm gonna mute All right i got muted but now i'm back all right um, so I was a bartender at the end of the night, and I did a good job. People would give me money. They'd give me a tip. <laughs> Once I became a social worker um, and started doing therapy, I never got another tip. It's not like Anthem, you know, sent me an extra 20 because I had a super good session. You know, it's not like um, all the things that you may be doing to help people that you care about with addiction or who are struggling, you're going to get a thank you. Um, so I'm going to thank you because um, loving people and staying connected to them while they struggle really matters. Um, I've worked with so many people over the last 30 years, you know, um, doing this work, and it really matters. Um, when people get better, it's usually because they get better because they're connected to people. And we're going to talk about why that is and how that can be helpful. Um, but thanking you for being here tonight and all that you do. Um, the areas that we're going to talk a lot about or a little bit about is the brain. Um, and I, the brain is a really important piece of um, why people struggle with addiction. And um, it's really important when it comes to trauma. Um, but I, what I want you to know, I mean, this is a two day training down into 30 minutes, but that the, the brain is impacted by trauma and unresolved pain. It's also impacted by addiction and the brain is totally capable of changing no matter how long or how hard things have been. So it's you know important to know it, but it's also important to know the potential that we all have. Um, 
If you think about what makes something addictive, I'm sure you all have certain ideas. Um, certainly when you think of addiction, you think of different chemicals, um, but addiction is bigger than just chemicals. Um, you know, it's about, um, it can be about different behaviors. And most people who struggle with addiction um, struggle with more than one thing. Um, and we'll talk why that is. That's my dog and her bone. I'm not saying she's addicted to it, but she's certainly really happy every time she sees it. Um, but when I think about a talk about addiction, I try to think about what it is that makes something addictive to people. And we know that um, we don't get addicted to things that don't have any intensity to them. So I'm older. I like Advil. You know, it's one of my favorite things. Um, but I'm not addicted to Advil because when I take it, I don't really feel any different. Maybe a half an hour later I do. What makes things addictive is that there's a level of intensity. Um, there's a positive feeling that you can get from it. But also for some people, it isn't about getting high or having a positive experience. Sometimes it's just about feeling normal or to get a sense of relief. There might be guilt and remorse when it comes to addiction, but it really depends on the stage of change the person's in. But for sure, what makes things addictive is that they work fast. So drugs that back when oxycodone, I don't know if you remember when oxycodone wasn't addictive, when everybody told us it wasn't. Um, and then, then all of a sudden it was, which I could have told you and many of you who've had family members struggle with that drug could have told people. Um, all my clients were taken off it. And then they were all put on new things that were supposedly not addictive. But I didn't really trust the doctors at that point. So I'd ask my client, is that addictive to you? What does it do for you? And one of my clients said, oh, um, it immediately makes me feel different. I love it. You know, so it's not um, it's really about what we would call a state shift. Like you're in one place and then you're in another Anything that can switch you, switch your state quickly, um, has the potential to be addictive. The, um, the connection between trauma, which I specialize in, or neglect, or unresolved pain, is that um, it makes you more vulnerable. Because you want that state shift, you want to switch moods, probably more than other people who aren't dealing with pain. And some people say, well, there's are there people that come into addiction without any history of trauma? I think that is definitely true. That can be. But then um, by the time you get into addiction, you're going to have some kind of pain or trauma. It kind of brings it. You know, it causes lots of different problems. And so when I'm talking about things that are addictive, I'm thinking of not just alcohol and drugs, um, but gambling. Um, there's certain addictions that our culture um doesn't mind so much. Like you can play around with perfectionism or working too much, which can cause a lot of consequences for your body and for your family. But then there are the ones that most of us are familiar with in, um, in our culture that we punish people for, which is alcohol, drugs, gambling. Um, sex and love can be um, really addictive to folks. Video games. I do work with people who self-harm and say that it's very addictive to them. Um, certainly social media has become a big issue for people. So the thing that makes something addictive is its potential to switch our mood, um, to make us feel better, to make us feel different. And the faster it works, the better. Um, but there's also other questions to think about when it comes to addiction and exactly what is it doing for you? So over the years of working with people, I stopped asking what people were doing. I stopped looking up what new drugs were and what they were made of and what, what you know, the addictive potential. I started asking, why are you doing it? And what are you hoping to get from it? Um, for many of the clients that I've worked with over time, um, addiction was a way to feel like they belonged, to attach, to be in a group, that sometimes that's what pulled them in. Um, that loneliness or feeling different or less than made them vulnerable to getting together with people that were using drugs or alcohol. Um, for some people, addiction is a way to avoid a certain feeling or to have a certain feeling. Like maybe it's not okay for me to be angry, but when I drink, I can be angry. Maybe, you know, um, it's very hard for me to um, tolerate certain emotions. And so I want to get rid of them. It can be a way to medicate. It can be an aspect of family culture. So um, 
I work with a lot of folks where addiction is multi-generational and um, somewhat normal within the family. And to be different, to not drink or not use drugs is to be different. Um, for many people, it's a protective part of a dissociative client. And that's this is more of a slide that I would use um, in when I'm doing a training with therapists. But there are some folks whose um, PTSD or trauma is so extreme, um, they have parts of them that feel like they control the drug use. But the, what drives therapy for me or what I try to understand with the folks I work with is what relationship they've developed with whatever they're addicted to, because it does become a relationship and becomes a relationship that becomes more important than other relationships. Um, if you haven't had any exposure to Dr. Gabor Mate, he talks a lot about addiction and recovery, many topics, um, especially trauma. But he talks about how um, drugs, alcohol, anything that people are addicted to can help shield them from pain, but also allows them to engage in the world um, in a different way, like a way to kind of be shielded or protected. Um, and that it's really hard to understand addiction without asking people what they're hoping to get from their use. Um, this slide just is about um, what I've seen in my experience of working with folks who've had a lot of pain, um, that it's like a pulse line um, when they tell me about their life, bad things happening, other bad things happening, and not always bad things happening um, that the family may even know about. Rejection at school, um, learning issues, mental health struggles, ups and downs. And when you go through a lot of those ups and downs, you often miss regular developmental stages. You don't learn how to manage your anger. You don't learn how to make certain friends. You don't learn how to steadily show up for things. Um, when you're going through all these ups and downs and different types of pain, it's hard to go through the stages that other young people may go through. And, you know, the word trauma is being used a lot. Um, usually when you think of trauma, you're thinking about pretty intense experiences like sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse, but it really isn't what happened um, to someone. It's how what happened affects someone, you know? So there can be very painful things when you're growing up and young, um, young that you get exposed to that may have a long lasting effect on one person and maybe not in the other. For those of you who have multiple children, you know that different people have different temperaments. They're born, some are born hardier than others. Some are born with more tendency toward risk than others. You know, But when it comes to trauma, it's really about how what happened affects you. And it can be things that we don't normally think about like early medical problems, temperament issues where you don't fit in with your family or in school, bullying, learning differences. Um, so it isn't always the traditional um, types of trauma that we're all, that we all think about when we think about that word. But it isn't really about what happens to you, it's about um, how it affects you. So part of the movie, we were building this sculpture together and somebody said, I had been sexually abused. And she said, and what it taught me is that I'm not safe in my own body. So it's not just what happens, but what meaning you make of it and how that carries forward in your life and affects you. Um, there's a lot of negative thoughts that one develops after having um, unresolved painful experiences. People can feel responsible for things they're not responsible for. They can feel unsafe now because they felt so unsafe before. Um, you can feel badly about yourself um, and it can make it hard to connect to other people. So many people I work with who struggle with unresolved pain um, and addiction have a lot of negative thoughts about themselves and a lot of difficulty trusting themselves and other people. So it's about the negative impact that those experiences have. And it also takes a lot away, you know, so um, painful experiences. And I consider, um, you know, I, I've been on both sides of addiction. So I've struggled with it personally and um, caused others pain because of it. But I've also struggled as a caretaker and as someone who really deeply loves people who struggle with addiction. 
Um, so I've seen how dramatic that can be and how much it's taken away from me. You know, um, it's also really, you know, Paul and I were talking about the lack of available treatment. And it's also made me question sometimes the system itself, you know, so it can affect us all either way. You know, you can struggle with it as someone who's actively addictive and has a traumatic background, but also caring about people it can really take a toll on us. And um, one of the biggest things that addiction does for people is makes them um, unable to predict their own behavior, promising things and not being able to do them, disappointing people that they love, um, and then also not ultimately being able to trust themselves. There's a cost um, when you grow up with um, some unresolved pain or histories of trauma. Um, you learn to um, lean harder on survival skills versus life skills. You know, you learn to, um, you know, uh, hustle, get by, um, work um, in ways that doesn't make sense to other people, but makes sense to you. You know, life skills are um, things that we do when we're stressed that make us feel better. Survival skills kind of take blood, you know, they take a lot out of us. So you'll see many people with histories of trauma um, who live on survival skills, you know, and many of us who've loved people who are addicted can get into that mode too, is that we can have some really good life skills. And when I talked to Paul about this group, he talked about all these different self-care things that get talked about. And that's really important. You know, if we're going to love someone who's going through lots of ups and downs, we don't want to go through the ups and downs with them. You know, we want to learn also how to um, keep our own life skills intact. <clears throat> If you haven't been exposed to adverse childhood experiences or want to learn more about them, there's a lot out there on ACEs. Um, there's a lot of research that connects adverse childhood experiences or painful childhood experiences to vulnerability to addiction. But not just one of these causes any of these things. And many people have multiple things that you see at the top of the slide um, and not be vulnerable to addiction. But um, having things and growing up and having multiple adverse child experiences, childhood experiences makes you vulnerable. Lots of research on it. Be interesting to read about if you haven't read about it. Um, below the tree and the roots are some of the cultural things that also make people vulnerable. So there are different communities that struggle with addiction because of things that are happening in their environment, not necessarily in their home. But um, there's a lot, you know, the word trauma comes out a lot, but I also think a lot about unresolved pain, different things that can make people vulnerable. Um, so undiagnosed learning differences. So some of you may have children that struggle with that. Some of you may struggle with that. When it's not diagnosed early, it can make you feel not good enough, you know, and you can really struggle to fit in or to succeed. A lot of mental health diagnoses cause unresolved pain. Um, many people um, struggle with medical problems young in life and cause um, what we would say a vulnerability to addiction, being bullied, temperament differences, um, where you feel like you don't fit in, you know, or you can't fit in your home or outside your home. But anything that makes you feel outside of the herd. So um, as humans, we're really driven to attach and connect to others. Um, it's important for us to survive to do it. Um, but anything that makes us feel unable to connect is going to make us vulnerable um, and anxious um, and cause pain. You know that if we don't address addiction, there's a lot of consequences. Um, many of you have probably seen and witnessed some of these consequences. Um, those of us in the field um, who work with trauma and addiction know that um, if we don't address the addiction and help people get into recovery, that they're going to have more trauma. You know, they're going to be more vulnerable to it. Something just quickly to mention that is a whole training in itself, and that is the impact that active addiction has on your brain. So if you're in pain and you're struggling and you don't have enough dopamine, and dopamine is the drug that makes us kind of feel good and connected, um, and you find something that works, you know, that kind of works. It doesn't even have to work perfectly, but it shifts your mood. The brain is going to be kind of interested in that, you know. Um, 
And so it can get wired around things. Um, when I've worked with someone who said, most of my life I felt invisible, but when I went to the casino and I won, suddenly I felt seen. And she said, I'll never forget that moment. And she kept going back over and over again, because when you're vulnerable, the wiring starts like that. It can be like falling in love. It can feel like this is the thing for me. Um, the problem is that when it works like that, the brain becomes vulnerable, sends you back, and then there's all these cues and things that actually trigger you picking up again. So those triggers and urges that you may have heard about, you know, are not just something that a person is consciously, like I think of drugs and this is what happens. It's kind of wired in. So part of recovery is to get the brain to rewire and not find ways to switch states with things that are actually going to put cause harm. But there is a way that the brain then goes into a seeking and wanting state um, after being exposed to things that are addictive. The good news is, is that the wiring kind of quiets um, and can go into remission when people stop using. Um, so one way to look at this, you know, um, is through looking at the slide here, is that there are painful childhood experiences, what we call adverse childhood experiences, but also adult experiences or community experiences that cause pain. You know, not everything um, that is painful to us is traumatic. We can work through things if we get support, but that pain, if it's unresolved, can make people vulnerable to addiction. And the addiction creates memory networks, um, triggers and urges and these things that um, we're vulnerable to. Just think about some of the things that are habit for you and how um, wired they can be. Like for me, um, morning and coffee are kind of fused together. Like it's not a terrible habit. It's not getting me in any trouble. But when I wake up in the morning, I think of coffee and they're like together for me. Like I don't want them to be separated. Um, there's some urges and triggers about morning. You know, and when I have to go get blood work and I have to not drink coffee, I don't like it, you know, but I can survive it. But if I have a lot of pain and that coffee or whatever I'm taking fixes that pain, it's going to be harder for me, you know, and the triggers are going to be more intense. So there's trauma, you know, at the bottom of the slide, which causes pain. Then to deal with pain, you do things addictively, but that causes some wiring, you know, um, and those are what we would call memory networks in my world. Um, those, that wiring and that addiction causes more pain and more trauma and the cycle kind of goes around. So a lot of the work for me as a trauma therapist is starting at the bottom. It's helping people resolve their pain, um, make peace with their past, um, make new memory networks, you know, um, and make new connections, you know, and find other ways to deal with their own pain, you know, so they're not so vulnerable in the future. This is kind of a busy slide, but it just shows on the bottom the adverse childhood experiences. So we'll just say pain that has not been resolved makes your brain a little different. So if I'm worried at home about things that are going on at home, I have a harder time going to school and really focusing. You know, um, if I have a hard time focusing at school or I don't do as well, it's possible that it's going to be harder for me to succeed or fit in. So if you look at that pyramid, you kind of can move up, you know, the pyramid to high risk behaviors. So a lot of the interventions that us therapists are working on is trying to start at the bottom. It's help people when they're young and have experienced pain, um, resolve the pain so that they can focus more, succeed, do well um, in anything they wanna do, connect, make friends, um, learn regular life skills. Um, but if you didn't have that opportunity, so I work with mostly adults and they've moved up the pyramid, you know, I'll work with them and that pain and then help them make sense of some of the ways that life didn't work and, and help them learn the skills they knew, need to learn. The epigenetic arrow on the side is just about the synergy between DNA and unresolved pain. So we can carry the DNA to be a little vulnerable to an addictive disorder, but the more pain we have, the more stress, the more vulnerable we are. So a lot of my work is working with people to resolve their pain and also um, making, you know, assuring that they don't do the intergenerational transmission. Um, I work with mostly adults, 
they get into recovery, we work on new skills, they become better parents, um, and they are able to help their children when they struggle. Um, so it's, to me, very hopeful work. Um, I don't find trauma work upsetting and it hopeful. I also think things like this are helpful. Um, we're doing more and more post um, pre and post scans in the brain. So we can actually see um, when we're doing these scans. So I'm an EMDR therapist. It's a type of, um, it's an evidence-based trauma therapy that helps people with PTSD um, or unresolved pain resolve it. And, um, and this is one of the brain scans that shows a woman talking about her trauma before treatment and then after treatment, the amount of activation and how triggered the woman was. And then after, when she was able to resolve some of the pain, how different her brain looked. And this is really important when it comes to people who are vulnerable to addiction, because that active brain that's triggered um, is gonna have a much harder time thinking through choices versus the calmer brain that can that has resolved the trauma. Um, these are also um, some brain scans of folks that um, struggle with addiction and show a little bit about um, what the brain can look like after recovery. And we know this to be true, that um, things can change. You know, that um, when people get into recovery or are able um, to heal, that things in their brain change. But that in the beginning, it's difficult. People are much more impulsive, struggle more with their mood, you know, um, but this to me is extremely hopeful. Um, so the opposite of addiction is really, you know, recovery is bigger than abstinence. You know, um, recovery is a whole process of rebuilding life and finding meaning and finding peace. For me, because I work so much with post-traumatic stress disorder, it's um, recovery is a lot about being in the present now, no longer triggered by the past. The past is the past, and now I can just experience the present. But the goal um, of recovery is not to be like this big, strong tree all by yourself out on a hill. You know, that isn't really what most people want, um, particularly because human beings are very focused on connection. Um, the opposite of addiction is to be out there, you know, big, strong tree with others, you know, close by, as close as you want them to be, you know, um, but in some form of connection, you know, some form of community. You know, so, so much of trauma work and therapy is to help people connect, you know, um, to others, you know, but it's also about reconnection. Um, so much of um, addiction and trauma takes you out of your own body, your own life, out of your own family. Um, so, so much about recovery and working with people in recovery is to help them reconnect to their selves, you know, to their families, to their spirituality, to their purpose. You know, so often I think, you know, I'm, I spend a lot of time outside, you know, and I'm on the beach collecting all these pieces and all these pieces were once something really quite beautiful and they've been tossed around in the ocean, um, but then they have a different kind of beauty, you know, so a lot of trauma therapy and a lot of addiction work is helping people sort that out, you know, um, that yes, there were painful things that happened in the past and it may shape you differently now. And how can you still find something, you know, that's really beautiful for you, really important for you. Um, and again, I always start with a thank you, end with a thank you in any talk I do. Um, it's really important um, when you care about people who struggle with addiction to um, know that you're not alone in what you're doing, you know, and that it, it really matters. Um, you know, I used to think as an addiction and um, trauma therapist, am I ever, is it ever going to end? It just feels like an unending, the amount of people that need help. You know, how can what I do possibly make a difference? But many of the people that I've worked with over time have gone on to become advocates. Um, they become leaders in my field um, to make changes politically um, and really change the system. So, you know, you're definitely not alone. Um, every person you help, it matters too. Um, and that um, also how important it is also to consider ourselves in that equation, taking care of ourself. Um, this is just some contact information, but I am, like Paul said, I'm located in Bar Campstead, Connecticut. Primarily what I do um, it, these days is training. Um, so I trained a lot of therapists. 
So I spent a lot of time throughout the country training therapists. Um, and then the film is uprooting addiction. So you know a little bit about that. All right, I'm gonna stop screen sharing um, now so that we can actually talk to each other. Um, so that was a lot of information. Um, and, you know, therapists, we kind of think in our own way. You know, So like, to me, those are interesting things to talk about and look at in slides, but you may have other things that you want to talk about. Um, but is there any way that I'm wondering if I can answer some questions for you? And I'm going to remove the spotlight because I actually want to be able to see you. There we go. Um, otherwise, I just see myself, which is not so fun. Um, so I just wondered if there was any thoughts or things that you wanted to ask. Or any questions? Um, I have a question. I, um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about EMDR and um, just a little bit more about what, how you conduct it, what you do and how it's effective for people with PTSD. Okay, so EMDR is um, eye movement repro um, <laughs> EMD desensitization and reprocessing therapy. It's been a long day. Um, so it is, um, like I said, evidence based trauma therapy. Um, the theory behind EMDR is that the current symptoms you see now are related to past unresolved experiences. So an EMDR therapist usually meets with the client and takes a look at the present issues, like what's going on now, traces them back to the past, picks like pivotal memories that are traumatic to the client, and then reprocesses them one at a time. So you bring up the painful experience, um, you use the eye movement while you're thinking of the painful experience, and it what it does is it kind of allows you to reprocess the memory and restore it correctly. So a lot of things that happen to us as children, we blame ourselves for, um, or many traumatic memories still feel like they're still happening. It restores the memory correctly so that it's in the past. So it's um, so it uses eye movement, but sometimes you'll hear people talk about tappers or tapping rather than eye movement. So some EMDR therapists use eye movement. Some use these things called tappers where you hold them in your hand. Any um, trauma therapy that you do that's um, gonna move the memory involves some version of exposure. So there's something called exposure therapy where you have to put yourself into the memory and really um, experience it again. Um, there's cognitive therapies that make you write about or tell the story over and over again. So EMDR does something very similar. You bring up the memory, you really focus on it, but the difference is that it adds the eye movement which seems to make it easier for people to, um, you have to pay attention to two things at once, the memory and the eye movement. It seems to make them easier. It's easier to tolerate the difficult memory. There's lots of um, EMDR.com, the EMDR in, um, International Association have a lot of um, like questions that you can get answered on their websites. So um, the research is there and explains it in more detail and you can watch short videos about it. And, and are there really eight parts to it? Um, mm -hmm. and, and in like, so in a typical, well, maybe it's hard for you to just have one typical session, but, or client, but let's say, you know, one of those people that you highlighted in uprooting, is that, would that be, you know, eight parts over 20 sessions or 30 sessions? How many? Yeah, it really depends on the client, you know. So in the film, um, at least um, two people had done EMDR, two or three of the people in the film. Three actually had all done EMDR and they worked on some pretty painful childhood experiences um, and one of them I worked with, we worked for about a year together on that. You know, um, some others worked a little longer. It just depends on um, how much trauma you had. You know, if you had an adult trauma, so if you had a pretty decent childhood and say you had a very bad car accident and you did EMDR on that, it would be a lot faster than if you grew up in a situation where you were abused, physically or sexually abused um, as a child. So. 
takes longer. Yeah. Um, Liz, did you, or L Liza has her hand up. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Can you just describe a little bit more about like how the session works or maybe I should just watch the movie or. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it works like regular talk therapy. So you'd like go to regular talk therapy. You and I would, you would say, okay, um, there's this thing that keeps coming up now. Then you and I would figure out, all right, how's it related to your past? You know, so, um, you know, uh, so I'll give you a life example, my own example, that's light, not a traumatic thing, but I was afraid to go to the dentist as an adult. And I mean, a lot of people are, you know, but I couldn't figure out why I was so afraid to go. And so when I went to the EMDR therapist, we, um, they did something called a float back where they said, think about being the dentist, notice how you feel, go back in time. And what it went back to kind of shocked me. It went back to when I was a little kid, you know, I fell and I had a cut of my head. My mom brought me to the ER and in the ER, um, I was held down. I was a feisty little kid. And so, and back then it's the early sixties, your parents didn't come in the ER with you. So my mom's far away and I'm being held down by four doctors in white coats with a bright light in my face. So to me, why am I thinking of that memory when I think of the dentist? Well, if you think of the dentist, it's a person with a white coat, you're in a chair, there's a light in your face, and it's not pleasant, you know, and you're kind of alone. So it was just so interesting to me that that's where it went. So when I worked on that childhood memory, which is, you know, not my mom's fault, not, you know, I fell, it was bad. And even the doctors didn't really have much of a choice with me, but it was kind of a painful thing. And I didn't have anybody around comforting me. And, um, and so it was really interesting to find that out, resolve that, work through my fear of the dentist, was able to go with much better result. And one of the things that helped was to notice the difference. Back then, no matter how hard I yelled, they were going to hold me down. Now I'm an adult and I can say to the dentist, hey, before you do that, could you do this and that? And you know that was part of the therapy was realizing I had control. Now that's not PTSD. That was just a traumatic experience or difficult childhood experience. It did have a lasting effect. When you think about, um, when I think about my clients with addictions who struggle with addiction, many of them had had a lot of interpersonal um, experiences that were very negative growing up, and they don't trust people. You know, so one of the first things we work on is those memories. Otherwise, I feel like they're not going to stay in therapy and trust me. So when you pull the memory up, though, what it looks like is I describe it. I'm not gone. I'm on the doctor's table. They're holding me down. And the negative thought about myself is I'm powerless. And then I'm doing the eye movement. And during that process, um, it was pretty upsetting. Like I could feel like all the feelings I might have felt as a kid, but not so upsetting because I'm tracking this kind of annoying eye movement while I'm feeling it. And then while I'm in the memory, I realize, oh, when I go to the dentist now, I'm in control. You know, I could do this. I could do that. I could leave, you know. And so instead of this memory kind of informing me forever, you know, that I'm powerless, um, it really felt different after that. You know? So I don't know if that's helpful, you know, but there's there is a lot of information about EMDR if you Google. But I'd be careful where you go when you Google because you can land. So not to get into too much minutia, but in that example, had you said to the therapist, I really have a problem with the dentist or was it more mm -hmm. I had this memory and it kind mm -hmm. of came out that it was related or yeah no the problem was the dentist I had no idea what it was connected to and it was actually helpful really helpful and um to know what it was connected to to, to not feel so like what is wrong with me but think about that in a more extreme way you know like I have people that come in that can't trust anybody you know, they want to, they say they're going to, but they really can't. And it doesn't make any sense to them, you know, or their addiction doesn't make sense to them. You know, uh, one woman I was working with, um, you know, she said, I don't know. I started smoking, you know, when I was 13. I said, what was going on around that time? She's like, oh, but not a lot, but I did have that sexual assault around that time. And, and how close were those two things? She's like, yeah, but she had never really made the connection you know, um, that her addiction started with this pain, you know, and it doesn't take people off the hook, I guess. Um, you know, you still have a responsibility when you have addiction to, 
take care of it. So I, a lot of talks I do, um, people are like, are you just letting people off the hook by saying they're, you know, they have an addiction because they've had this pain. Like, I, no, it doesn't take you off the hook, but it, it does help things make sense for you. You know, and it can be the beginning of you taking care of yourself and telling people what, what was going on for you. Um, but you still have the responsibility, you know, of, um, of taking care of yourself. You know, and you still have the responsibility of figuring out how to get into some form of recovery so that you can be there for yourself and for others. Thank you. Anita? Uh, actually, hi, I think you answered my question. I was going to ask if EMDR only works on one specific traumatic event or if it helps if somebody doesn't know what the trauma is coming from, but it's a like complex trauma and multiple childhood issues. Um, does EMDR work for that? Yeah, it does. It just takes longer. Mm -hmm. yeah, so most of the people that I've worked with in my career have complex trauma. So we, um, you know, we don't just work on one memory. We work on themes, you know, like I can't trust people might be one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm powerless might be another. We just work on different themes with them over time. So instead of doing talk therapy, we're doing talk therapy and EMDR. Thank you. And if you have complex trauma, then you probably um, also need to work on skill building for self-care mm -hmm. because folks with complex trauma are probably like some of the most awesome people in the world as far as helping you, but they're not very good at taking care of themselves. You know, so I've worked with a lot of people in my office, if there were a fire, you know, they'd be taking care of everyone, but they're not good at taking care of themselves. So a lot of that therapy is EMDR, talk therapy, and then a lot of skill building to help people take care of themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts that people have about this topic or? Thank you for your talk, number one. Number two, you use the phrase more skill building any any specificity you could bring to that term more skill building yeah so i think about um all the feelings and situations people have to deal with that might make them vulnerable to picking up drugs or alcohol and all the other skills that you need to do to manage that like tonight if we're all tired and stressed out you know, I'm hoping that each of us has a couple different things they can do to to feel better. You know, so I could, uh, I don't know, go space out and watch Netflix. I could read a book. I could do some yoga, you know. But if I had a lot of trauma or a lot of neglect, it might be I could smoke, I could drink, or I could check out playing video games. So I need to have a variety of things to deal with a variety of things that life brings us because life brings it. No matter who we are, we're going to have some uncomfortable situations. So skill building would be talking through with a client. You tell me that um, one of your triggers is boredom. What? Let's come up with a couple of things you're going to do instead, you know, of um, picking up, you know, or, you know, so just kind of helping people um, create and use skills that are nourishing to them. your thoughts or questions that people have? So this is a very similar question to, to what was asked previously <clears throat> and sort of combining your response to it. You're, you are well familiar with big T, little t trauma. Mm -hmm. The example that you gave about the early experience in the dentist chair, that would be in the small t trauma mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. Do you feel EMDR is as effective with big T versus little T? And did I hear you correctly and say it's it's really a matter of how many sessions you do? I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are. A little more, a little more thoughts there. Yeah. Um, EMDR works really well if um, you had a very normal, nice or nice childhood without a lot of disruptions and a lot of trauma and you had adult trauma then it works super fast, really well. It's slower, but all therapies are slower. 
uh, trauma therapies are slower. If you had a lot of what you would call little T, like bad things happening and big T's growing up. So, you know, um, being bullied or being disappointed and then being physically abused by a parent, you know, so the, when you have a lot of those growing up, it takes longer because you've got more to work through, you know, um, equally effective, but just a longer time. But that doesn't mean that you have to work on every painful thing in order to do pretty well in life. You know, sometimes you, you know, I, there's not enough time sometimes and money to work on all the painful things that people have lived through, you know, and for me, I did some work on some, some big T's and it made a big difference. Um, it made a big difference in me being able to maintain long-term recovery. Um, the little T's, well, you know, I live with the fallout of them, or I might work with them at different times. So, and that's the same with many of my clients is that we've taken out some of the big things um, and that that's made a big difference. Um, and then the other disappointments and the other things that have been painful aren't as painful anymore. So when I'm working with addiction, I, I usually try to work with the traumas that affect people's ability to um, ask for and use help. Because we know when you struggle with addiction, it's gonna be hard to do it just by yourself. And many people with addiction wanna do it by themselves because they, they don't like relying on others or they've had bad experiences. So just working on that area, trusting others and being able to ask for help makes a big um, difference in people's recovery. And so they haven't worked on every bad thing, you know, or even whole categories of bad things, but they've been able to ask for help enough to get into some recovery group where they feel like they fit in and use it. And that makes a big difference. Thank you for that. Yeah, Laura. One other question. Um, EMDR, is, is it um, a modality that you would use with teenagers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Teenagers like it because um, you don't have to talk a lot, <laughs> unless you like to talk a lot, um, but you don't have to talk a lot. Um, so for when I had some teens that I worked with who um, didn't talk much, they kind of liked that part. You can also combine it with some um, like arts for, for people who like art, you know, um, creating things um, has been really helpful. You know, adding um, like I'm getting distracted because there's a bear in the yard right now. My dogs are going insane. So oh my <laughs> yes, it happens a lot here <laughs> and it uh, is very distracting. Um, so like teenagers can create like a container or a safe place and you can use EMDR with that um, and it can be helpful. So yeah, they like it and they like the buzzers. Um, actually, the earlier you do um, trauma work, the better, you know, so if, if you know that a child or a teen has been exposed to some painful experiences, the earlier they do the trauma work and, and resolve it, the less vulnerable they're going to be to addiction. Hello and welcome to you. Thank you. Yeah. Are there questions that people have? Zoom, I think, I hope Zoom is um, canceling out the barking dog noise right now. So, yeah, because it's crazy right here. <laughs> How big is the bear? <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, they come in all sizes here. Now they um, they come after my compost and then make my dogs bark. So it's like a daily thing here. I don't know. Bark Hampstead has been in the news. If you later on Google the bear that went in the refrigerator and got the lasagna, it's on YouTube. <laughs> so it's it's from my town. It's the the bear went in the house, got in, opened up the freezer, took the lasagna, and went out the window. That's Park Hampstead. If you wonder where we are, that's where we are. Any other questions about anything? Um, Just to reference, um, the book mm -hmm. you referenced in your presentation, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. Yeah. Of course, everybody's got their different way of, of pronouncing Gabor Mate. But uh, great book. Mm -hmm. it, it, it absolutely piqued my interest in trauma when I first moved into the treatment field, it is a very powerful book and written, very well written, great, great language. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, yeah, he's a great guy. He was in the documentary. 
Um, he was a big catch to get him in. Um, and, you know, a very generous man. And, I mean, we had no money for the documentary. I had no business making one. Um, it was ridiculous, um, but I just decided to go ahead anyway. And it, and it was like everybody I asked said yes. But um, the film director said to me, we need a big fish and you have to get a big fish for the movie. I'm like, I don't know any big fish. I'm a social worker by Hampstead, you know. But I knew someone who knew Gabor Mate. And I emailed him and said, I'm going to be in New York City on this one day. I see, because I've been stalking you, that you're going to be there too. Would you, by any chance, be willing to meet with me to create this film? I don't know when it's going to come out. I don't know if it's going to come out. I can't pay you anything. And could you um, sign off and saying that you'll give me the footage? And he said, yes. He gave us his time. Didn't care. You know, didn't, you know, he's very generous that way. So I was very kind. Like so what do you do, um, Hope, when, you know, the person that comes in is actively using? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so th this happens a lot with THC. A lot of our parents have, have you know, their kids are just using THC to self-medicate mm -hmm. daily, you know? Mm -hmm. So they come in and they're high on THC. Do you just go, no, nope, out of here? Or how do you handle it? Yeah, that is an interesting topic that's coming up a lot um, in the EMDR world. Um, so I, I do harm reduction work. So I do work with um, non-abstinent people. Um, you know, the goal of keeping them alive and hopefully they're going to get into a pathway of recovery. But there are some drugs that interfere with um, memory reconsolidation. And that's what you do when you do trauma work. Um, THC is one of them or can be one of them. Um, I've worked with, you know, now that marijuana is legal, it's really changed things as far as my caseload and what people do. So I have some people that use it, want to use it, and don't care to stop using it. So I've done EMDR with them, but they're not intoxicated. So there's a difference. Um, there are people that use drugs regularly, um, any drug, prescription drugs, and they're not intoxicated when you're doing EMDR. It works then. But if they're high... If they're outside the window of tolerance, they're um, not present, it doesn't work. So I had one client who was regularly using EMDR, I mean, doing EMDR and using marijuana. And she's like, EMDR is not working for me. And I said, I, I don't think it's going to work well until you stop smoking, because when you come in, you're in pretty bad shape. You know, um, then she had to quit smoking for um, to get a job. We did. She's like, wow, EMDR is working so much better. What are you doing differently? I'm like, I'm not doing anything different. Your brain is different. You know, so there are certain drugs that will affect the processing. But I have done EMDR with people who are using, um, not intoxicated, but steadily using. They do pretty well. Um, when they stop using, then we have to check because sometimes a little bit of the, the memory is still activated because we did it when they were using. Done EMDR with people on methadone. Not a problem as long as they're dosed correctly. You know, um, so my preference is, yeah, they, I don't I don't like to send people away, but if somebody comes in intoxicated, I find a way for them to get home. And then we rebook and have them come back another time. I, I know you probably wouldn't give a percentage, but I've heard one therapist say basically, well, you, you did say that basically everyone that's struggling with a substance use disorder has trauma that they need to work through. Um, would, do you agree with that? I think that they have pain they have to work through. You know, I think they're, uh, as therapists, we see a percentage, a different percentage of the population. So there are people that never interact with the system who get into recovery, who have an addiction issue. But as a therapist, we see a, a small, we see a different percentage. You know, we see people that can't make it and that's why they're in seeing me. They tend to have a little more pain than others. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say most people have had some painful experiences, um, but not everybody has PTSD. And the addiction what, what, itself is painful. Mm. What about people with addiction that have the co-occurring issues, but mm -hmm. or issues that have come up and they could, you know, so there could be co-occurring learning differences or 
anxiety or depression or or even you know because of THC use psychosis. Mm -hmm. So um, there are you know a, a little bit of psychosis. Yeah. Um, so can you can EMDR work in those people as well? Yeah, I mean it can. EMDR is used for trauma. So um, if I have um, bipolar disorder, you know, often, um, you know, not, not always, but often I've had some painful experiences because of it. The diagnosis, um, being hospitalized when I didn't want to be, something that I might have done when I was manic. So I can't use EMDR to um, work on your bipolar disorder, but I can work on the fact that um, you were hospitalized, you did some things embarrassed, that were embarrassing to you, you feel less than because of it, you don't like the meds. You know, so all of those things can be worked on. Um, most people with psychotic disorders have trauma also, and it will take the pressure off the psychotic disorder if they also are not dealing with flashbacks, issues related to their trauma. So. Um, I know you did a training at Mountainside, and I don't think it was just for the Mountainside people. It was open to anybody. And it was up in Canaan, Connecticut. And it just got me thinking that when someone is unloaded at the treatment center, it would be great. And maybe it's true that for High Watch, Mountainside, Silver Hill, the biggies, Karen, do they all have the capacity for EMDR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm the consultant for a lot of those organizations. So, yeah, and we're um, working on, that's what I'm training now is training EMDR therapists, integrating them into any place that someone where an addiction might land, including um, prison. So making sure that they're um, working with a project in Chicago with some research attached to it where um, people get, who are incarcerated get EMDR um, before they get out. Um, but also, yeah, um, Mountainside has EMDR folks, High Watch has EMDR folks, um, Karen and I'm actively involving, involved with training a lot of those um, therapists. So, yep, it's there. Well, well that's hopeful. Yeah. That's, that's good news. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's a lot of bad news in the addiction <laughs> and mental health field. So it's good to No, the addiction and mental health field has come a long way. Uh, the addiction yeah. field has come a long, long way from 30 years ago when I started, where we blamed everybody and we didn't support families. You know, it was all tough love and no other option. It's really different now, and I'm so grateful, but I'd like to be part of um, making sure it keeps moving in that direction and that it's trauma-informed all the way through, throughout the families and also the folks that are struggling um, and also trying to make sure that people um, have access to treatment when they want it is um, kind of the focus right now. Um, the, How about, the, the, about I'm that. just so, thinking of one family, a person that's dealing with trauma, but then it's family related. And so maybe one of the parent, one of the parents decides, well, I'm going to go ahead with the an e EMDR session, see if it's going to help me as well. Do you, you mm -hmm. find that there's like parallel mm -hmm. recovery journeys from trauma yeah. when using EMDR? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I've worked with a lot of family members um, who have struggled with someone else's addiction because it's very traumatic and shocking and, um, and it makes it hard to sleep at night, you know, and you worry so much, you know, so just helping people resolve at least um, the past things so that when you see what's going on now, you're not reacting to both the past and the future. The past should inform us, but if the past is traumatic, when something looks like it in the present, we just have a shocked, traumatic response versus a calm response. So I have worked with a lot of folks um, yeah, to um, resolve their own stuff and done a lot of work myself on the impact that other people's addiction has had on me so that I can be an unbiased therapist, you know, because otherwise, you know, I'm going to react like they're my family members, you know, so to do a lot of work in order to be with other people's family members, um, you know, and it was really helpful. To, to learn what I am responsible for and what I'm not responsible for and what I can do and what I can't do, you know, and why I believe that people can change and things can get better, but also I'm realistic. You know, so I'm not, you know, when family members ask me for money, I'm not going to give them money, but I am going to take them out to lunch, you know, so, you know, I'm not so easily swayed. 
So that's a, yeah. it's, it's a lot to learn. Yeah. Uh, now, in the bio, there was the term psychodynamic. And so in the film, Uprooting the Addiction, when you had everybody in the same room and you were creating the roots and the leaves to the tree, um, was is that psychodynamic? Is that what you were doing or... No, that was, we were just creating a visual representation. So we created a tree and then we started with what made you vulnerable. That's the root, what held it in place. So we just made it so that we could all do it as a group, you know, and okay. it was, it was a pretty powerful day. Um, we spent uh, seven hours doing it. Um, and everybody really talked from the heart, talked about their life experiences. And we had all these counselors there to back up, um, People, if they had a hard time and nobody had a hard time, they were all eating pizza and having a good time. It was the people on the film crew that had a harder time because they were not used to hearing that stuff, you know. So it was a good day, though. Yeah. And so on the individual therapy, it's sort of a version of that that goes on, but you're just, yeah. just doing it in a group form. Yeah, it's a group format. So I, I work with um, as a consultant with organizations like treatment centers and not, they aren't staffed to do everything individually all the time. So you can do something like that in a group. You can do the trauma work in a group and then everybody can experience it together. Um, and then you can do your individual work, you know, so that that tree, that whole process is a um, process that um, organizations can use to educate people on their, the connection between their trauma and their addiction.